Greetings. My name is William Turner. I, I am an independent researcher at Arlington, Virginia. The title of my paper, a finished fragment that I aim to finish and submit as an article for publication in Names, the journal, is titled A Critical Study of Names in McKinley Cantor's Andersonville. Perhaps no other novelist uses names more prodigiously, more insightfully, and more purposefully than McKinley Cantor does in his epic novel of the Civil War, Andersonville, recognized as Cantor's greatest achievement and winner of the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1956. The novel, weighing in at 750 pages and 350,000 words, abounds with names of all kinds that identify a host of characters and help tell the story of the infamous Confederate prison. Scores of names of prisoners, guards, military officers, prison officials, politicians, and nearby planters and families relate significantly to the portrayal of character and to the structure and theme of the novel. Hundreds more such names occur intermittently or in passing, often with a descriptor or two, or bearing a connotative meaning. They also may signal a change in point of view from person to person or from voice to voice. The hundreds of names enliven and enrich the novel and nominally broaden the scope. As Cantor presents, quote, a panorama of the Civil War and American life of that period, and that focuses on the microcosm within the Georgia stockade. Names fairly leap from the pages of Andersonville, many more than this paper can cover. Historical names and fictitious ones interweave in the narrative, as do family names, Christian names, nicknames, sobriquets, aliases, pseudonyms names of the enslaved, and even pet names. Names appear in the dialogue, in flashbacks, in interior monologues, and in streams of consciousness. Taken together, the names do more than identify characters and hint at character traits. They establish Andersonville as a work of historical fiction, create sociological and psychological realism, denote and typify some prisoners among the tens of thousands of anonymous ones indicate personal and social relationships, celebrate domestic animals as foils to humans, create humor and irony, underscore conflict, and illustrate Cantor's strongly individual style and his diligence and thoroughness as a researcher. A study of the names in Andersonville must begin with the eponymous title a place name denoting the site of a Confederate prisoner of war camp in southeastern Georgia during the final 14 months of the Civil War, where, where approximately 45,000 Union soldiers suffered and nearly 13,000 died. The name ending in Bill, and not to be confused with the village of Anderson or with the train depot there, and the relation of Andersonville to the official name, Camp Sumter, all come up in an early conversation between Lucy Claffey, daughter of a local plantation owner, and Harold Elkins, a Confederate surgeon and suitor whom she affectionately calls Cousin Harry. But it's Anderson, Cousin Harry, not Andersonville. The station was named for Mr. John Anderson of Savannah. So I heard, and the official designation of the new post is Camp Sumter. But you know how the troops are, Miss Lucy, forever applying a special name to something or other. They called the depot village Anderson, but they termed the stockade Andersonville to distinguish it. A focus on Captain Henry Wirtz, historically and notoriously the commandant of the prison stockade, reveals the depth and complexity of Cantor's use of names in Andersonville. Works, never could he spell this name correctly, the narrator tells us of the difficulty of prison diarist John Ransom in spelling the name Works, W-I-R-Z, not Works, W-I-R-T-Z, an error 
underscoring the difficulties of prisoners in understanding and pronouncing Wirtz's name. Ransom's diary entry also hints at the prisoner's bias and resentment toward Wirtz, not only because he is foreign born, but because he bears a foreign name, reflecting an historical dislike of the quote, unspeakable, unquote, names of foreigners among Americans of Anglo-Saxon origin going back to the 19th century and adding an element of social history to the novel. Of Germanic origin, the surname of Wirtz carries a stigma that marks and mars him and makes him a pariah in the prisoner of war camp that he commands, creating conflict and irony. Is your name Wirtz? Asks Captain Henry E. Noyes, 4th United States Cavalry, on historically arriving at the Andersonville stockade to arrest the Commandant and escort him to Washington, D.C. for trial. Yeah, I am Henry Wirtz, the other replies. Soon after Noyes introduces himself, Wirtz says softly to him, is it not odd? I was thinking, my name, it is Henry, and now you come to put me under arrest, and you too. Your name is Henry. Is it not odd? Very odd, said Henry Noyes. In fact, the sameness of the two Christian names is more likely a coincidence than an oddity. Given the popularity of Henry, in America around the time of the Civil War and the fact that Henry is the Christian name of more than 400 Union soldiers interred at Andersonville National Cemetery. In Noyes' case, the Christian name adjoins a surname of English origin, suggesting the common occurrence of Henry among the hundreds of thousands of immigrants arriving from England home of a line of kings named Henry, and settling in America between 1845 and 1865. After the exchange with Noyes, Wirtz says later to his wife, this captain, his name also, it is Henry. In the old country, Heinrich it would be. Replete with meaning, the quote, tells of A, the birth name of Hartmann Heinrich Henry Wirtz, 1823 to 1865. B, the strong ties of Wirtz as an immigrant to a Germanic country of origin. And C, the historical tendency of immigrants to change names and adapt them to American ears and tongues attuned to the English language on arriving in America. In addition, the quote betrays a hidden or subconscious belief on the part of Wirtz that having the same first name as Henry Noyes, the arresting officer, joins the two mentally and spiritually and gives them an affinity that Wirtz hopes will win him the good grace of Noyes and perhaps preferred treatment as a prisoner of war. Wishful thinking that reveals Wirtz's false hope for release and his need of solace and sympathy. The example illustrates Cantor's sense of the potency of names and his skill in creating psychological realism. Names function numerously and variously elsewhere in Andersonville. Foremost is Cantor's use of Tom, Dick, and Harry type names, or what Justin Kaplan and Anne Bernays call generic anonyms to denote and typify those within the stockade, alternately widening the scope and narrowing the focus of the novel. The names of Tom, Dick, and Harry and ones like them, of which there are dozens, belong to no one in particular. Appearing once or twice without surnames, they tag and personify the prisoners of Andersonville, all anonymous except for the ones that Cantor names 
for the purpose of storytelling. More specifically, the names of Tom, Dick, and Harry, and of Bruce, Charlie, Archibald, Hank, Harvey, Fritz, Owen, and others, each identify a particular one in the struggle of all to survive at Andersonville. The argument borrows from Plato's theory of forms. For the vast set of prisoners in Cantor's novel and historically within the stockade, there is one form or type of prisoner. In relation to the one, the names of Tom, Dick, and Harry denote and typify all. Thus, in a letter to Harold Elkins, Lucy Claffey writes of Ira Claffey as he watches the execution by hanging of six of the so-called raiders, historically a gang of thieves and ruffians within the stockade and the, and the dismantling of the gallows afterward. Quote, my father watched. He said it was a sight. Tom going off with a length of rope. Dick and Harry scuttling with a rafter betwixt them, unquote. Given the extreme deprivation and desperation of the prisoners, the three generic anonyms underscore the scantiness of materials and supplies, including wood and rope, that one and all must beg, borrow, or steal to survive. Among the tens of thousands of prisoners living in the crowded, filthy conditions with little or no food, clothing, or shelter, nerves fray, tempers flare, and prisoners argue, fight, and die over trifles. Waldo took umbrage because Ned snored. Amos claimed that Hez had stolen the bacon rind, which Amos had bought before. A young agnostic, darkly contemptuous of Catholics, called Harity or Hanrahan a mackerel snap or Pope's child. Herman said that he had heard that the whole 24th Michigan Infantry was made up of bounty men. And Guy from the 24th Michigan rose up to affirm that he was lying. Referring to no one in particular, the names of Ned, Amos, Hez, Harity, Hanrahan, Herman, and Guy, each focuses on one to encompass the prison experience of all while flexing the point of view and adding depth and substance to the novel. So weakened are the prisoners from starvation and disease that one says to another as they look upon a mate awaiting a ration of food and who is clearly dying, hell, he can't eat it, Bruce. Jaws won't work. As several new arrivals consider making a break for it, even at the risk of being shot, one assures another, Harvey, I'll be right alongside you. As old Tom Gusset, Sadler, 9th Ohio Cavalry, physically and mentally broken by the confinement and deprivation of prison life, lingers and rambles on about family members and villagers back home, those nearby lose patience and order him silent, prompting one prisoner to chide another, oh, hang on to yourself, Melvin. He ain't got long. In each case, the generic anonym, Bruce, Harvey, Melvin, captures the experience of one among many, if not all, while both widening and focusing the point of view and illustrating Cantor's style. Nicknames, sobriquets, aliases, and synonyms, pseudonyms, similarly abound in Andersonville, reflecting the historic and widespread use of them among prisoners. Nicknames and sobriquets describe character traits or physical attributes of those to whom they are attached. In keeping with the culture of Andersonville, aliases and pseudonyms additionally conceal criminal pasts and desertions from the army, as well as efforts to gain extra rations or to start new lives, which Cantor captures effectively. Such nicknames and aliases convey the dialect of prisoners 
and create verisimilitude as well as grim humor and irony. Spoken in the dialogue or to oneself in a dramatic monologue or reported by the narrator, they indicate personal and social relationships among prisoners, guards, and nearby families. As some of the nicknames and aliases are historical, they reveal Cantor's skill in weaving them into the narrative to recreate history, as well as his thoroughness of research. Number one, Rubber Legs and Chickamauga are three examples worth looking at lastly and more closely. He called himself number one in slang he had picked up after joining the cavalry. The narrator recounts of 19-year-old Edward Blaney, a corporal in the first Rhode Island cavalry whose fellow, whose fellow cavalry men call him Ed. Here's number one's chunk of kindling, he'd said, wanting to start a fire with the soubriquet sounding reflexively in Blamey's mind as the point of view changes from an interior monologue to third person narrative. He said, showing the richness and subtlety of Cantor's style. As Blamey is visibly bow-legged, Willie Collins, leader of the Raiders, the gang of thieves and ruffians who prey on their fellow prisoners, calls him rubber legs pejoratively and controllingly, as in come near me rubber legs and inside with you rubber legs. On asking blaming his name and finding it out, Collins ignores it and perversely insists on calling him Delaney, a sound alike while threatening Blaney for addressing him, Collins, as sir and not by name. What's your name, Blaney? Is it Delaney, you say? I have a friend. No, sir. Blaney. Don't go stirring me or I'll tear the velvet out of your head. Collins is the name, you addle cove. Willie Collins. Yes, Willie. Dropped in the dialogue, the sobriquet rubber legs, the sound alike Delaney, and Willie Collins' own name, all three underscore Collins's egotistical, abusive nature and his dominance over Blaney. The narrative elaborates further on a prisoner historically nicknamed Chickamauga. It was at the Battle of Chickamauga that he was wounded. It was at Chickamauga that he was captured. In the hospital, he had talked incessantly about these experiences, so the name clung to him. But also, he was called by a variety of other names. Pole Parrot, Pretty Polly, and Fortune Teller were some of the designations applied to him. This last because he carried a deck of ragged, dirty cards in his pockets. And he would tell you your fortune for one dollar confed. Chickamauga and fortune teller speak for themselves, clearly indicating Cantor's interest in names, nicknames, and sobriquets and the stories behind them. As a pole or a parrot, slang words for a snitch or an informer, Chickamauga spies among the prisoners and reports what he sees and hears of escape plans to Captain Wirtz, who foils and punishes the would-be escapists. So eager is Chickamauga to, to serve Collins, chieftain of the Raiders, and win food and favors from him that, quote, the epithet of brown nose was added to the weight of those other names he bore already, unquote. Within the stockade, some people said that Chickamauga's true name was Hubbard. Some said Hulbert, but it may have been Herbert or Hul Hurlbert or Hulbert. Amid the hearsay of prisoners and the uncertainty of historical record keeping, the five variants reflect the mystery of Chickamauga's true name as well as Cantor's efforts to find it out 
as part of the narrative. This concludes my paper in progress. It gives you a sense of my purpose, approach, and direction. More work is to follow on the form and content. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We have time now for some questions of William Turner on his paper about names in Andersonville. Let me ask you the first question. Um, I'm curious about uh, generic anonyms, the, the Tom, Dick, and Harry's of the prison that seem to, to function kind of in an everyman uh, position. And then you also noted that the author had done his research on actual prison names, a list of the prisoners. Yes. So were, were there then prisoners named Tom, Dick, and Harry, these kind of ordinary names? Well, as, as you, we know from that excerpt that I, that I had, uh, that they're used generically to re refer to those three prisoners who uh, scavenged the supplies from the, from the gallows. But um, certainly there, there were prisoners named uh, Thomas and, and, and Richard and, and Harold or, or, or Harry. And I, I, did, I did note that, that there are, that, that, that Henry is the Christian name of more than 400 uh, prisoners who are uh, interred at the uh, Andersonville National Cemetery. So, so obviously, uh, the, mm -hmm. the novel, the, technically it has a cast of thousands, tens of thousands, uh, with more than 30,000 uh, prisoners there at, uh, at the peak. And so what McKinley Kander does is just use the names selectively to try and capture uh, a, a sense of the multitude. Because he could, right, he doesn't actually have a thousand names in the novel, but but the ones he draws upon represent a much larger. Like one Henry is now four hundred Henrys. Yeah, yes, that that's true. And what struck me when I when I read the seven hundred fifty page novel at the beginning of the pandemic, when we all had extra time uh, on mm -hmm. our hands, and, and this novel uh, had been long been on my list, and I started reading it, and the uh, the names jumped out at me just the, the sheer uh, number of the names and the, 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 uh, the, the naming of animals uh, even. I haven't gotten to those yet, um, but, but he's got, cantor has got uh, at least two dozen names of uh, cats and dogs. We heard the speaker on uh, pet, <laughs> on pet yeah. places earlier, but, but I mean, that, that's another whole uh, a paper, I think, just to, to do the uh, study of the of the names of the pets, the, the 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 pigs, the dogs, the cats, and and also the the names of the enslaved. Mm. I, I haven't uh, I haven't gotten to that yet, but those are typically uh, just single names, and they reflect the the naming rights of of the of the of, of the slave owners. But I've, I've just, I'll go ahead. Okay, we have a question for you from an yes. audience. Anna Sepkova asks, is there any difference between the terms nickname and sobriquet or sobriquet? Oh, that's a good question. I've been uh, struggling uh, with that. Sobriquet is uh, a French uh, derivation. And I think uh, it, it's, I think it, it's a matter of uh, formality. A nickname is uh, a, a, a little bit less formal than a sobriquet. And a, a, a sobriquet is um, a, a little more formal and, and maybe uh, a little more uh, substantive. So my, my name is, is William, and a nickname for me uh, could, could be Bill. Bill is, Bill is my nickname. Bill is William for short. But we have that example of um, rubber legs. You know, we have that the fellow who is, has the terribly bow-legged, 
and the uh, the others call him rubber legs. So that's a little more, you know, descriptive, a, a little more uh, substantive. But but that's a good um, it's a good question, and I think in my in my paper I need to. I, I don't want to say split the hair, <laughs> but, but there is a distinction. And, and j- just as there's a distinction between alias and, uh, and pseudonym. So, so the, these are some of these uh, th- things that I'm looking at in this, uh, what, what's turning out to be uh, an encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedic uh, study. As I think you can get the sense of that. And, uh, it, it, it's very uh, interesting. It's a great uh, journey of discovery. I've learned so much in doing this. Well, we have learned so much from you, William, and um, just so much appreciate. Thank uh, you very much, Dorothy. It, it's been great. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>